Hello, welcome to uh, Current Chem episode six. We're talking about radio pharmaceuticals or that sort of broad category. Feel free to introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm Richard. I'm a master's student from Sweden. Uh, I'm Simon. I'm uh, from Switzerland, doing my PhD at the research group of Professor Holland at the University of Zurich. And hello, my name is Amory. I'm a French postdoc also at the University of Zurich in the Holland group. And I'm Oliver, the co-host from uh, also Switzerland. Yes, very, uh, very Europe- European show this one. It's, yeah, sorry, uh, Americans, about the time zones. There's no Americans on the stream. We can, we can talk shit about America. It's good. Yeah. We're free. Who are free to? To get started, um, I think there's some terrible Wikipedia pages to look at. So shall we look at some? So what do we need to know before getting into your talks? Because... I feel like a lot of people won't have a base knowledge of radio pharmaceuticals. I, I can probably type radio pharmaceuticals into this. I, I mean, I don't, or I don't know how to spell it, but here we go. Oh, sorry, I'll share my screen as well. Make it yeah. big. Yeah, perfect. There yeah. we go. I'm not going to donate to Wikipedia. Um, this probably sure. doesn't really mean much to everyone. Shall we? Shall we start more basic? Shall we? Shall we start at radioactivity, or is that too basic? Probably, yeah. Probably. Yeah, maybe that's... Does anyone want to have a go at explaining radioactivity then? Is there a good picture here? At Let's least the do. three main decay modes should be ex- explained, but at least. So I think, Ricard, you taking on what is radioactivity. Oh, right, <laughs> right. Base right. Level. And I'm a, now I'm a bit stumped, basically. <laughs> Some atoms don't like how many particles they have in their nucleus and such. They're quite unstable and want to eject them. Weird quantum stuff happens and we eject. Helium atom, uh, helium nucleus, maybe. So we have alpha decay. We can even make electrons. That's EFI decay. Some weird ones send out neutrons as well. We also have, uh, when they eject these particles, they are often excited. So they might also send out gamma quantum, yes, gamma rays, basically. So those are the few main ones that happen. So, like, a simple example would be some of the natural uraniums, uranium. We send out primary alpha, but also loads of gamma, and then daughters will happen, and those daughters will be radioactive. They will send out the electrons and more gammas, all the way until they reach a stable uh, element, basically. And yeah, plenty of nice maths, as you can see here. But <laughs> it's, it's quite fun. No matter how many radioactive decays you have, you can, they're always basically analytical. You can solve the equations analytically and get all the decay chains and how much you have of them after X amount of time, most of the time, at least. So that's yeah, you fun. can't really do anything to how they're decaying. There's, they're just decay on their own. You can't speed it up, slow it down or anything. It's, it's basically random as well, as random as we can get. And of course, there's the spontaneous fission one as well there. Uh, for example, uranium oh, will spontaneously yeah. fission when you have a sample of ore. It will split into smaller elements like uh, molybdenum and some other ones. Can't really recall it. Around yeah. 80 on the periodic table and like a hundred something on the periodic table, hundred forty maybe. Yeah, sadly you can't really use those for any drugs. No, 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 no. If, no. if you use them, you you erase entire populations of humans, yeah. not just some. Yeah. <laughs> or something. And I think the main question is what what specific uses of radioisotopes are there in therapy and for what kind of diseases? All right, we're jumping ahead. All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, we yeah, had that's the main subject after yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. No, no, it's good. <laughs> of course, you know the main uses of uh, different kinds of radiation therapies for treating cancers, but the, the Simon and Armand, uh, if I recall correctly, deal a lot with imaging, which is often not talked about as much. Yeah, so, so uh, just yeah. back on to like radioactive stuff. So, Rickard, you're dealing with alpha emitters. Alpha emitters mainly, yes. And so, Simon and Amory, you, you, the, the the same meter. We use Beta Plus and um, some of our group also use uh, Tech 99M, so that's a gamma emitter. Right, okay. So, so that's, you're... that's what you use for diagnostics essentially. And yeah. then for actually treating stuff, you, you use uh, Beta Minus and alpha emitters typically yeah basically the beta plus emitter will just like when one once they will decay they will just like 
at some point emit an electron somewhere and just like emit two uh, gamma uh, two gamma rays and that's what you detect then with a camera yeah so it's basically the decaying of the pet emitter ah was beta plus right the uh, yeah. annihilation to mm. the, the, the annihilation with the electron yeah. mm. and they're Funnily enough, also 180 degrees apart, so it's, you can yeah. exploit that for imaging. So if you have coincidence, two of them going at the same time and hitting the camera, and you can then trace it back to a single point. These are terrible Wikipedia pages. They look like they were written yeah. by physicists. They're not written to yeah. be understood, are they? <laughs> like, it's radiation. It's not that difficult a topic, but this thing is like if you knew nothing about radiation and you tried to learn it from this page. Yeah. You'd be lost. Do we need to know? Do people talk about cyclotrons at all, or do we not need? I'll it? talk well, about mine a tiny bit in mine. Do we want to? You want to mention what a cyclotron is quickly? Because we've mentioned synchrotrons before, but not cyclotrons. <laughs> it's very different. <laughs> very different. They look small. Different though. particle that you use. So synchrotrons are electrons going around, and cyclotrons are uh, whatever. Yeah, typically, like, typically protons and deuterons. Then you typically use um, use those to shoot to a target to get a transmutation reaction, so you can get some desired nuclide. So we're using mostly um, zirconium eighty nine, and that's actually one that's produced in a cyclotron. We typically sh get that shipped from Amsterdam. So is it is the cyclotron facility a bit like a synchrotron facility where there's like kind of a big national? cyclotron or is it are they well, a bit smaller i mean or? many many hospitals here have um cyclotrons cyclotron. that are made for um mostly fluorine yeah. so you can then make fdg which is the most or like the most used radio tracer thus far it's essentially the gold standard behaves like a normal glucose but it's got it's radioactive so you can track it very nicely that's but you you work with a synchrotron in a different city is it a cyclotron sorry yeah i mean so, we just buy from a commercial source or right okay um, my uni my university hospital has a pet this uh, cyclotron but yeah. not one to make the elements i'll be talking about so we actually have our shipped from denmark yeah so all of your elements that you're talking about are are made artificially in in a cyclotron is that yes pretty yeah, much? Most of i think so yeah. i don't think it's that popular anymore to use like uh, radioactive waste from nuclear reactors anymore i don't think well for you, you, there's no other way than using waste from nuclear reactors for um technetium so far yeah so if you use the tech 99m then you have to use that but then you just get a generator and the same thing goes for gallium which is also just one of the most used nuclides um for pet imaging and that is also produced in a generator so you just buy a box and then can elute, you can elute it like every few hours and get your pure gallium out of there. Uh, Oliver, any questions? Are you, you're an expert. <laughs> Nothing so far. Well, I haven't asked any hard question ever yet. I'm going to think of one. No, that's right. <laughs> um... I'll, I'll think of some later. Okay. Goodbye, goodbye Wikipedia. <laughs> It's, it's never as useful as I think it will be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really, I really try and campaign for it, but it, it doesn't come through for me. Yeah, so right. here we have a very nice periodic table where most, if not all, of the nuclides that are used in some sort of nuclear medicine application um, are here and color-coded by what they're used for. Most prominent example, as I've already mentioned before, is fluorine 18. Copper is pretty cool because it goes through a, a beta plus and beta minus decay. So that it, then you can actually do therapy and um, pet imaging. imaging with the exact same molecule, just in higher doses for therapy. There's really, you can essentially use all, all types of stuff. And if it's not used yet, you can probably invent it if you really want to. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's a question. I'll, I'll throw this one to Amory then. Is this a thing that constant, constantly in development or is this a thing that's sort of like, how do you discover like a new isotope sort of thing? Or or have all the isotopes discovered and they're finding uses for them or are people still like working through this? I think yeah, people, it, it depends. Like it's more like the people who are trying to develop new isotopes, I think are more like physical chemists who like literally works with radioactivity. 
And then once they discover a new one, then may, depending on what is going to be the decay mode, then you can maybe find an application, either pet imaging or, or therapy. But like for for now, there is like literally a lot of like isotopes that we can already use. And for the same, and then the same thing is that when the for most of them, uh, they can be made also like from transition metals. So then you need to like literally design a chelator that's gonna like keep your radioactive metals like stable in vivo so then there is like a lot of chemistry going around in february some people were just going to design some new chelators some people will design new targets for different cancers and then they're going to use like new uh, isotopes so far like as a conium for patch imaging i would say it's gallium 68 but it's a short half-life emitter so it's for it really depends with ty which type of cancer and which type of molecule you're going to use. For gallium-68, you're going to use like small molecules that are going to like go to the cancer cells. With zirconium, you can use antibodies that have a super long alf um, biological half-life, and then they can reach um, different targets. And copper also can be used either with like uh, um, antibodies or small molecules. There was one thing we might want to show first that's really oh, yeah. used by nuclear physicists and nuclear chemists. It's the nuclide chart. It's the oh, yeah. extended periodic table that includes all isotopes, and it's that... massive. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Zooming yeah. in hard. The Karlsruher rule. Karlsruher nuclide Yeah. Ooh, and really it's cool thing. two pages of it. But of course, there is a online version as well. The, like the, the chart of nuclide is essentially pretty full except for at the high end where we're still adding with like organesson and whatever yeah but they and um, they're not always known but then lower down we essentially already know most or all of the nuclides that there were and you can then essentially if you want to introduce a new one to nuclear medicine you can just go to the chart look it up and in theory you could start designing it and start making it yeah. To the right and left, we have the different isotopes and neutron counts, and uh, upwards is protons. So down here, way down here, we have new, uh, helium and hydrogen. Whoa, something happened. Down here, and that, those black ones are all the stable ones. So the stable isotopes we find here. Well, that aren't radioactive either. The oxygen 18. We talked about fluorine 18, that's to the left of it because it's one left neutron. Way up here, whoops. whoops. <laughs> it's, it's having difficult. There's a lot, there's a lot of things to hide. Yeah. yeah. And way up here, you notice how all the black ones start stopping, uh, stop uh, existing. So we, we don't have any stable ones basically past here. Actually, I have a question for you guys. Uh, why aren't why are some isotopes stable and some not? Oh. Easy question. <laughs> How do I? Particles sometimes like being together, and sometimes they don't be together. Like being together. <laughs> There's essentially a valley of stable things, and then in the middle bottom there will be something that cannot decay in either side mm. to something more stable. So it's the most stable like in comparison to everything around it so it's not going to decay any further once again i feel like this people watching will probably be more confused than they than they were to begin with but i'm so bad That's at the explaining process so hi looks great all right hi i'll be talking about targeted alpha therapy and uh, how we go about designing them somewhat and selecting for the different new clients but first a bit about myself I have a bachelor's in chemical engineering from Chalmers. I'm now doing a master's in materials chemistry with focus on nuclear chemistry. I did quite a lot of home chem ever since I was small, and that led to a healthy glassware addiction. Super healthy glassware addiction. So a tiny bit about astatine, <laughs> which will be the main focus of my targeted alpha therapy talk. It's a halogen because it's the second to last one just before tennessine. It's squeezed between polonium and iodine and will, its chemistry is quite difficult and random at times. It was quoted in 1960 that sometimes the results are in, uninterpretable, not to say exceedingly frustrating, which is something that happens often in chemistry, but astatine defies logic at some, often. 
Uh, it is thought that it's around 1 to 30 grams of astatine on Earth at any moment, simply because it exists in the decay mode of some of the heavy elements like uranium, a tiny, tiny bit. The longest half-life one is eight hours, so it will take 50, no, sorry, it will take eight hours for 50 of it to disappear, which equates to about 10% loss each hour. The amounts we produce are so small and so tiny that the chemistry of it will, it's exceedingly difficult to get it well understood. It will react with most stuff in solution, metals, or just the walls of the containers, and it will stick there, or it will just use its radiation to just destroy the molecules and create new stuff. So stuff like uh, common properties like oxidation numbers and what kind of species are in solution can ve vary very much <laughs> depending on simply how much oxygen there is and how much salt you have in it or if there are some trace metals or other halogens you might form astatine iodide and different mixed species weird stuff. Uh, we work in the university hospital each week with about 800 megabacquerel. That means 800 decays, no, 800 million decays per second of astatine, which equates to picomole quantities or nanogram quantities. So it's incredibly tiny. You, I'll never see astatine to have any color. I'll never see grains of it. I will only have it in solution. Yes, and to the right is the vial we use to keep the astatine in chloroform after we have extracted it. So, targeted alpha therapy. Alpha, ther no, alpha radiation is high linear energy transfer radiation. It means it packs a punch, but it won't have a, a long range in tissues or in air for that matter. So, it's very efficient to killing cells, but you won't have any range. like beta particles, electrons, they will go through several hundred cells and might even leave the body, possibly. And gammas are even worse, they'll just go straight through you. At least you can image with them. Uh, the thing is, if we manage to get these, this alpha radiation and alpha emitters to the tumors, the radiation will most likely damage the tumor. It will damage more of the tumors than the healthy tissue. Instead of just blanketing the entire body with radiation, we can pinpoint the cancer cells. And if we basically attach this to molecules that will seek out the cancer. We can kill basically single cell cancers as well. And uh, I said that uh, alpha radiation was highly in high LET uh, radiation. So if it hits a DNA strand, it will most likely lead to what's called a double strand break, which will be really difficult to repair uh, because cells have repair mechanisms. And if you only damage one of the DNA strands, it might reconnect with different mechanisms. But if you manage to hit straight to two of the strands in the close proximity of each other, there is a high probability of the cell dying. Things we need to design an alpha, uh, to, uh, a radio pharmaceutical with an alpha emitter. We need to select the alpha emitter with certain properties. We need to find a targeting vector, proteins and similar. And we need to find a suitable application because it will not work for all types of cancer and it will not work for all types of distributions in the body. So the first thing, alpha emitters. There are circa 400 of them in that big nuclide chart we just shown. We need, we need this to be a high enough energy or not too low at least. A manageable half-life, so it won't decay too quickly. If it's two seconds half-life, then we'll never be able to do any chemistry with it. Or, but if it's too long, then we need too large quantities of it. We need too much of it, basically. Or it won't, the time for therapy will be so long, it's not practically doable. The chemistry must be well understood and uh, most cases quick as well. We need just to mix the stuff and administer. Toxicity, mainly in, in what kind of daughters it will produce. If we select uh, <laughs> just plain uranium, it will make polonium, it will make radon, radium, and all of those will send out loads of gammas and will be really nasty towards the body. And of course, availability. I can't just select the, I don't know, astatine 220 or something because the half-life, you can't make it and you can't find it and it wouldn't work. So from 400, we end up with just six candidates. And in my work, we're focused on astatine 211. 
it will decay 50% of the time via electron cap, no, 58% of the time electron capture, which is a weird, similar to beta plus. And uh, then it will go down to an alpha emission, or it will go alpha and then basically sending out uh, the electron capture thingy and some gammas. And this is perfect because then we will have one alpha for every single astatine decay. There will be no annoying daughters. We will not have extra alphas. We won't have betas or anything so, like that. And uh, we make it, well, the Danes make it by bombarding Vismuth with uh, alpha particles, which will make astatine 211. Uh, you can see the target over here, which is just an aluminium plate with some bismuth on it. And the yellow big thing is the cyclotron we use. These ones are way larger than the PET cyclotrons you find in uh, hospitals now in the days. I think PET cyclotrons will be about, I don't know, a cubic meter or something. It's performed in the Rikshospitalet in Copenhagen, Denmark, and transported to Gothenburg by taxi. Since it's 7.2 hours half-life, then it will be needed. It, it's required that it's sent to us rather quickly because it will decay away in like two days, maybe, and it will be unusable after two days. So we only have one day to work with it, basically. We extract it by heating it in this quartz tube and then use inert gas to uh, just flush it into a chloroform solution. Then we need to select the targeting vector. So different kinds of proteins, peptides, even nanoparticles have been used. So we need to attach this astatine to some part of this molecule and it will be, need to be stable enough and it will be able to find the molecules. It will require to not be too toxic. And hopefully if we can uh, accommodate all those needs, it will find the cancers and attach and the astatine will decay. Of course, this is random, so it might miss it or it might hit it and it might kill it. And suitable applications. Here in Gothenburg, we have done some treatments of relapsed ovarian cancer where it has disseminated into the bowel cavity. And we're usually talk, always talking about small cell cancers and very, very small tumors that basically you cannot use any other isotopes for. It's not completely true, but mostly true. In America, they used uh, it for post-surgery, basically treating whatever cells they might have missed, cancer cells, and try to destroy them as well. And the great thing that we have confirmation is that instead of blanketing the body with radiation and leading to radiation sickness and side effects, the localized alpha emission is so local, it will only mostly kill the cancer cells, which will lead to very, very low uh, doses to the surrounding tissue. And since if we can target it, it won't end up in other places and damage those parts. So it's basically no or very mild side effects. And currently there is a phase one slash two therapy uh, of acute myeloid leukemia. So my own work. My own work is uh, done on the side of the clinical stuff. It's looking at how astatine behaves in different kinds of solvents, especially chloroform and DCM, carbon tet, because we discovered that if you try to evaporate away the solvents from astatine, like chloroform, it will stay in the vial. But if you use stuff like hexanes or methanol, you will lose up to like 50% of the astatine to just evaporation and it'll be just blown away. So my supervisor wanted me to look into the radiolysis of these different kinds of solvents. It creates weird stuff, loads of radicals, the alpha emitters, just, the alpha radiation just destroys the bonds and loads of weird organic stuff and even inorganic stuff will be created. My main work, the ma main practical work I do is lo loads of liquid-liquid extractions or solvents extraction where we have two phases. You can see here down in the right image, a lower aqueous layer and a top organic layers. And we use so small volumes, it's incredibly annoying to pipette a microliter of radioactive chloroform before it just evaporates and disappears. I also noticed that it's phase inverted, so the water is in the bottom instead of chloroform, contrary to density, because the water just loves the uh, glass vials. And to the left are some residues from chloroform, probably polymeric stuff that's been formed. So yeah, radicals are really, really annoying. They make weird stuff and the electrons go everywhere. You have, for instance, you can see these like species of different kinds of uh, chlorinated carbons and the polymer down here. But my favorite, uh, I found this interesting 
paper that will be relevant to my work where the, where the good old 60s Americans let off some nuclear bombs and they used the gamma radiation to test uh, what kinds of weird species are formed in chloroform upon massive amounts of gamma radiation. Yeah, I don't trust those electrons. Yeah, and some of the practical work I do. This is my fume hood, nothing special. The amount of dose we receive is so tiny because the main punching power is from the alpha, but the alpha will never leave solution or the vial. And the gammas that will be emitted from relaxation of the excited states or polonium and such, they are, sure, there are plenty of them, but they interact so little that we have never measured any appreciable dose when we've worked with it, or at least they haven't told me yet. Uh, Basically, loads of pipetting back and forth, measuring on uh, scintillation counters, which are basically solid state uh, Geiger counters, if you're accused of the similarity. Uh, I always like that in nuclear chemistry, you can just measure it on a Geiger counter or a sodium scintillator, and you'll get basically atomic resolution of the compounds you have instead of using a mass spectrometer or similar. And we usually just don these disposable scrubs and extra sleeves and double gloves. We have never had any real spills. Sure, the gloves get contaminated, but nothing ever penetrates into them. Or at least not past the first one. And of course, the freaking astatine turned jello. Oh, one of the days we have an automated system with loads of uh, tubing. And we think one of our uh, the doctorate student uh, accidentally left some solution in one of the tubings and when we ran the acetine uh, 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 chloroform solution through it, it pulled with it something weird, organic, and turned acetine solution yellow. And then two weeks later, the uh, rubber PTFE cap inside the, the seal inside the cap had been reversed. Probably someone dropped it and then just put it back without looking what side. It was then the rubber just dissolved into the astatine solution and ruined that one as well. Joy. And that was the last one for the year as well. So brilliant way to end the corona year. Fucking trash. So thank you all. And if you have any questions about targeted alpha therapy or astatine, you can always hit me up on the Exp Explosion of Fire Discord. Thank you. Thank you, Ricard. Thank you. And I'm very sorry about the yellow chemistry. Mm. <laughs> Fucking hell. Nanograms of it, and it turns yellow. It only exists <laughs> for one day, and it turns yellow. Have you got acetine now, or did you run out again? No, no, we only get it uh, once, every week, uh, once every other week from Denmark, and we can only work for it for one day, because you lose 10% each hour, and basically, let's see, it's like, 12% left after like 24 hours or something less than that. What do you do on other days? <laughs> I procrastinate <laughs> I... writing my thesis. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, so it doesn't, doesn't come, come pure from, from the, the thing, they make, make it like, like pure, pure or, or do, you do you have to do any purification? Do I have to skip over that a tiny bit? We get it on the targets. I'll go back a bit. These aluminium targets with bismuth on it. And then we scrape them with this machine. And then the scrapings go into the quartz tube, which then is then inserted into the kiln to the right and heated to around 700 degrees. An inert stream of uh, N2 is then blown over it and will carry all the vismut and uh, some of the vismut and the astatine with it into a chloroform vial, which we have cooled, and it will just stay there quite happily, hopefully. Um, uh, how? There's a question in the chat, uh, Rika. How are isotopes separated? Do they use like huge centrifuges or? All oh, right, right, right. In this case, we have uh, the, for uh, the fortune of, by running the cyclotron at specific energies, we only s select for the specific reaction of bismuth 209 plus an alpha particle turning into uh, astatine 211 and then sending out the neutrons. So we won't have to care about uh, uh, the, pure radio, the purity of isotopes in this case. We will gain, we will, the, the targets are already isotopically pure to a large extent. Oh yeah, yeah. No, another question from chat is, is how much does samples cost? What's it, what's it per gram? Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. So quick maths. 
an estimation, I said like nanograms amounts usually, like 10, uh, annoying calculator. Oh, okay, what's it, what's um, it per nanogram? Uh, like, mm, yeah, the so. thing is that we pay, we, we pay 10,000 sec for it, which is like a thousand euro. The thing is, that's not the price. That's how much how we just pay the guys to give it to us and then they pay for the production in because it's their research. So it's a, a joint uh, research operation yeah. with production and uh, usage because otherwise it wouldn't work because the price barely makes sense in this case, like 10 nanogram and then just use. So, so for, for the actual, if you're getting it as, as radiation therapy, at the moment, it's quite an expensive oh, operation. Right. This is quite interesting. Uh, loads of companies and the purification method mentioned have been uh, patented now. And people and companies are designing smaller uh, cyclotrons that will be able to be bought by hospitals where they can produce astatine isotopes locally because transport would otherwise be an issue similar to pet chemicals, I guess. They have to be on site. Uh, so yeah, like in this case, I get uh, 100 euros per nanogram. We are sure that makes sense. A trillion, kilometer per gram. Yeah, it, per gram doesn't really make sense because we don't need gram amounts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nanograms yeah. will already be 800 million decays per second. So that's 800 yeah. million uh, clicks on the Geiger counter per second. So it's just, that's the good thing about short half-life. You only need tiny amounts. So, and, and there's, there isn't even a, is, there isn't even really a gram of astatine on the earth at once, is no. there? And you can't separate, you can't extract it either, basically from, or it wouldn't make sense. There's difficult, there's enough extracting from other stuff. So you have to produce it. It wouldn't be viable yeah. otherwise. And uh, once it's, uh, technically it's not the production costs. That's the uh, big thing. Uh, it's more about just getting started. But luckily now, uh, my supervisors at Salgenska has designed a system for quick uh, extraction, distillation, and even labeling on antibodies, uh, which means that if we only solve the production problem, which is on its way to be solved, uh, we will be able to see this therapy in the near future. I have no idea on how many years we're talking, but like the, the, the clinical trials were like phase one to two, which is already great. So uh, astatine therapy should be widespread in 20 years? I actually believe that, yeah. Okay, it's pretty cool. Uh, I actually believe that, yeah. So I, I have no idea if it's 10 or 20 years, but within that time span, within my lifetime and ours, all of us, I really believe that we'll see it be used to cure. But sadly, at the moment, phase one and phase two on human trials are mostly palliative. They're just to ease uh, uh, the last years of the persons. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Um, Simon. And all right. Yeah, Simon. So. Okay. All right. My turn then. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, our method, our photoradiochemical method that we've developed to actually label proteins with our um, PET emitters. We're, we're also calling it radiochemistry in a flash. We'll probably see why that later. So um, we're using synthetic chemistry and then combine it with, um, um, with the radiochemistry with some of these um, nuclides here, and then do essentially all of the studies from cells over animals, which we can both do in house and then we're collaborating with other groups around the world um, to also get into translation and uh, actually get our molecules into humans. Um, so first few words about PET imaging. So we're, make, um, we're emitting a positron, which then interacts with an electron, and then this positronium ion decays into um, into two gamma rays, which we, can, which we can then detect, and this then leads to uh, leads to a um, very good picture. Um, and essentially, through this, we can find where um, where activity or where our activity is. And as long as we can use, um, or as long as we can combine our radionuclide with some sort of linker, 
to a targeting vector. So um, here we're also mostly using uh, peptides or proteins or have a, a, a actually a lot of antibodies, like uh, Rickard just also said. Um, yeah. And then hopefully you can get some humans into a machine like this and get and figure out where the cancer is so you can monitor therapies. Um, so it's currently the way that uh, these uh, bioconjugates are produced is with, is with these types of um, reactants. So use uh, so they, they typically use some sort of activated ester or other electrophile, which would then react with either a lysine or a cysteine side chain. And all of these um, methods have typically have some drawbacks and essentially that they're, the reactions are pretty slow. They're rather harsh conditions for the protein, so you can actually damage the protein. Um, you always need to pre-purify the protein and can't just do it in, um, in the buffer, in the formulation buffer that it comes in. And then in the second step, you do um, the radio labeling, which is typically much faster and done in within a few minutes or so. And so what we found is a method um, with which we can cut out this middle bit because it's also prohibitively expensive to characterize this um, because you have to look at it in terms of toxic toxicity and distribution all over the body because you're not labeling all of it. And why, by cutting out this one and by getting a, um, a better um, a better reaction going, we can actually label our proteins in fully formulated buffers within about uh, 10 or 15 minutes to get to a, uh, a finished radio tracer um, yeah, within, within very short time. So that's why we're calling it in a flash. Um, so some of the linker groups that are used for stuff like this are these um, benzophenone diazerines and aryl azides and they either go through radical um, through radical chemistry, carbenes, or our favorite in our lab is the nitrine, um, which has been proven to be the the best so far we've found. Um, and this is when it's irradiated, it loses a, 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 a one molecule of nitrogen, which then gets us to this nitrine. And this then does a ring expansion towards this ketinimine, which is a very powerful, um, a very powerful electrophile, which would then react with the lysine side chain of our protein. Um, so our photoactivation is actually pretty fast, and it, it essentially only depends on how much light we can pump into this um, into our vial. So we originally started with a, with a with a tiny flashlight off of eBay. And then um, we, we actually had to recharge it before the reaction was actually done. So we upgraded to a bigger reactor and then finally to a quite powerful LED, which allows us to put the reaction time down towards about uh, towards 10 minutes. And we followed this here um, with HPLC traces and see the, the product going away or the starting material going away and we plot this to get this kin kinetics plots. Um, so this is our overall reactions that we've essentially, that we're essentially doing as our standard now. So we're using this DFO chelator here, connected to this ARL side unit, and then by hitting it with some light, uh, or yeah, so we're using zirconium 89, which we, um, which actually get shipped from, um, from Amsterdam in a pig like this, and then um, mix everything together, adjust the pH, hit it with some light, and then um, essentially just flush it down one of these solid phase uh, or size exclusion columns. We get the, we get directly to our um, finished product like this, um, which has a structure like this. And this can then be directly injected into a mouse or hopefully in the future into a human. And now looking at some pet pictures, these are, these are some um, athymic nude mice with um, tumors on their back. So um, we've here 
for this paper here, we did a head-to-head -head comparison study between a conventional uh, method for um, uh, or for radio labeling the antibody with uh, and an NCS group, and then compared it directly to our new photochemical approach. And you can see that um, the, the conventional approach has still a, a much higher background, even after 72 hours, because, um, because most of it is here in, this, in the liver of the mouse, or, so, or quite, a lot of, quite a large portion is stuck in the liver of this mouse. And so, and with our photochemical method, where we never have to store our intermediate, where we just where we get it um, to the mouse very fast, and um, the protein cannot uh, aggregate as as much, we get a much better picture. And also, we find the same um, results when we then, after seventy, after the last image, after seventy two hours, uh, euthanize the mice and then um, pick out all the um, all the organs, and uh, and then count how much activity is in each organ, and you can see that both the conventional um, antibody as well as the um, our new method are pretty good at picking out the tumor. However, there's in the liver there's quite a lot of this conventional antibody and the background for our photochemical method is pretty damn low. Um, yeah, so what's next in our research? So we're essentially, now that we've shown that it works, it works pretty well in mice, um, we're trying to translate it to humans and which is actually the work of Amory, who's, who's here also today with us. And that's his project now. And I'm focusing on automating the, the whole process to make these um, these pet tracers essentially at a push of the button so that essentially uh, in the end every hospital could buy the box that we have and have an on-site antibody pet um, pet center with, and could just use antibodies for their pet images with the same or with the addition of this um, this box with the same tomographs that they already have. With this, I'm already at the end. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and uh, all of the group for great collaborations. Thank you, thank everyone. You. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Have I have a try. small question already for Simon. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right, so what's the time scale of those experiments, the photochemical ones? Uh, the photochemical experiments are done within 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, we get to, uh, or we do typically irradiate for 10 minutes and then we need like five minutes for purification and drawing a syringe. Right. So, so do you have the mice, are the mice like, because you've got to do everything really quickly. So is it, is it a weird lab setup in terms of like mice and chemistry all in the same place or is it? Well, but yeah, basically when we receive the conium, it arrives on a Monday. We're going to prepare a tracer in the morning, get the injection done in the afternoon, and then we can just like follow the images after multiple time points and up to Friday or Saturday. So yeah. basically you can work for a week with zirconium, thanks to yeah. its, its half-life. Yeah, we always call it our zirconium week because we like everybody prepares their own, their samples that they want to test, and then um, they're ready on Friday or just the week before, and then on Monday, zirconium there. Everybody wants to lab. Everybody wants to do their work, and uh, we get a lot of like work done in a week. It's quite amazing. <laughs> How often do you get shipments of uh, zirconium? Well, it kind of depends. This this month we had two shipments, which is really unusual because we had just so many projects that after the first week we had it were not done so we decided to just get another batch okay um but we before that we had one in early fall and then um, i don't know if there was any in summer not really i think so no. it, it sort of depends on our react um on our schedule how far we are with our 
experiment. Uh, the zirconium, was that also produced in, by activation or was it separated from uh, nucleus, the uh, waste? It didn't no, quite... that's actually, essentially you bombard um, it, it, yttrium or ytterbium? Um, yttrium, I think. Yttrium with, uh, with a proton and then absorb that and then you get to um, to uh, zirconium 89. It's also done in a cyclotron. But you also need a quite powerful cyclotron for these kinds of nuclides. So it's not one of these small ones you can have in every um, in every hospital. At least not yet. But at least you're making the cows that you can uh, milk for the uh, isotopes, right? And you're thinking about making a commercial unit. Well, you can't have, can't really have. Uh, I don't think you can. There's a generator for. Okay, what's well, that? The gallium then? Did I mix them? Gallium, gallium is a generator nuclide, okay. so that's pretty neat. Um, yeah, I mean, with a li with a half life of about seventy hours or so, mm -hmm. you can oh, really wow. like order it, ship it, and then um, open up the box and start your work. Oh yes, of course. Right. Yes. It's not that big of a problem then. I did confuse them. Yes. Um. All right. There's some. some... Cool general questions coming through on chat, but I reckon we'll jump to Amory's presentation, if that's right. You got the presentation, yeah? Sure. All right. Cool. So basically, since I'm the same lab than Simon, now I'm going to focus on something else and some result that I obtained during my PhD. So before starting my postdoc here, which is like, we had some nice, the nice talk about astatine and zirconium, and now I'm, I want to show more about some copper chemistry. And also like before going to literally doing some medical uh, application and PET imaging, what needs to be done by a chemist in terms of designing new ligands um, that will bind copper and make sure that they would be stable prior to in vivo application. So just to show you my radiochemistry journey that I did so far. So I started the, my first experiments with radio, uh, radioactive gallium 68 uh, back in 2014, uh, thanks to a master internship at the University of O in the group of uh, Prof. Steve Archibald, where I was working on the radio labeling of iron oxide nanoparticle that can be used as bimodal agent for MRI and PET imaging. Then I went back to where I come from, which is Brest, so this tiny part in, in France. And so I did my PhD in the group of Professor Raphael Tripier and the Dr. Veronique Patinek, where I just focused on organic synthesis and microcyclic chemistry to design new chelators for copper-based radiopharmaceuticals. And during that time, I was able to go to Freiburg in Germany uh, with Dr. Mike Bartoloma, um, to develop some new prostate cancer imaging agents, which I'm gonna present today. And since then, I'm now in Zurich in the group of uh, Jason Ollon. And like uh, Simon said, and as you can see on video, we are making new bioconjugation methods by using light to develop new pet tracers. Sorry. So basically, when you want to do PET imaging, like there is a lot of nitrogen chelators, which that you can see here, which is called DEPA, which is a acyclic chelator with two picolinate units and that coordinate copper. Also some pyridine-based derivative, as well as some polyazar macrocycles, which is as uh, which DOTA is like one of the well-known chelator like available on the planet for like. Um, Transition metal uh, coordination and lanthanide. And uh, one ligand based on a cyclone unit that was developed by my former group. When you want to do some MRI, you can use gad gadolinium ion. Um, uh, gadolinium DOTA is like the most famous uh, uh, gadolinium contrast agent in the world. And uh, I think they produce like something like a ton of gadolinium DOTA every year. And then you have also some other microcyclic derivatives. So it's just an overview to show you that like polyazar microcycles are literally like super well known and like well studied now for the, because they have super nice um, coordination properties towards transition metal and, uh, and lanthanides. And for my project, it was like, I used a smaller 
microcycle, which is called the Triasa Cyclone 09, quite difficult again. So it's basically just a microcycle with three nitrogen here that you can functionalize with acetate arm, for example. And those are the most commonly used um, co-percolator based on the TSN moiety and that are used in the clinic. You can have the same kind of, uh, by changing the coordination arm and changing the coordination number, like coordinate gadolinium also and create some MRI agent or some fluorescence um, agent based on the luminescence of the lanthanides, like europium and ytterbium, for example. And what I'm gonna focus now more, it's more on the design of like tachin based compound for the development of PET tracer for the prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is one of the, is the most abundant cancer type of cancer in men. Um, I think it's like now a month ago or something, there's finally uh, one compound that has been FDA approved for prostate cancer that was like literally uh, developed in, in some research lab in academia. So it's like a step further for to, go, to continue to develop new chelators and new compounds for prostate cancer. And there is an, an another expression of like, which is called gastrin releasing peptide receptors on the cancer cells. And this is the target of, cho of choice to design new PET tracers. Basically one of the gold standard I'm using nowadays, like uh, Simon showed before that we can use antibody as well as like uh, Ricard, but here is like a peptide, a small molecule that will bind specifically to the gastrin releasing peptide receptors. And then we, you can add your activity over there and do it by doing a PET scan, see if you are actually in the tumor or not. And some researchers have shown that like the positive charge over there has a really uh, huge impact in terms of binding properties. And they were saying that you need to have like at least a plus one or plus two charge to reach like the cancer cells like specifically. And also many researchers show that um, the chelators over there had also an impact on the binding properties. Even though it's normally just the peptide that binds to the receptor, so you would think that, so whatever you're gonna put there would not change at the, uh, not change anything. But we show that like it literally has an impact when you change the chelator. And that's what we're gonna see now. So the objective of like the work I was doing during my PhD was like to study different chelators and see the impact on the binding properties compared to the gold standard. But to uh, to go into more in vivo application, like chelates must fulfill many criteria. So I just listed the the most uh, common ones. So the synthesis needs to be easy. You want a fast metallation uh, regarding the half life of copper, which is twelve hours. You want it to be also selective and inner, because in, in the body there is like many endogenous uh, metallic cation that could like exchange with your chelator, and then you would have a loss of copper sixty four and then some free uh, copper in your body so you wouldn't have a good image. Also, you need to be careful about the transcalation with different enzymes and the dissociation due, which is well known for copper complexes that there are ma many enzymes that can reduce copper two to its copper one form. And most of the time, this leads also to a dissociation of your tracer. So the gold standard is still uh, for the NOTA derivative. So TICAN functionals with three um, acetate arm. And I've been developing different um, TICAN derivative with like pyridine based or cyazole based that we were thinking that sulfur is known to bind to copper one. So we were thinking at the beginning to have like kind of a switch. If like you reduce your copper two to copper one that the nitrogen would not coordinate anymore but the sulfur and you would have something super stable. And we found out that this one was like a really good can candidate, but the problem here is that there is no um, bi bio bifunctional uh, answer to like couple it to, um, to a target. So I designed a new one with a free carboxylic acid here that could then be used to like uh, in a namide based coupling uh, reagent to couple it to our peptide of interest. So a little bit of chemistry and synthesis. So some compound, we just uh, synthesized the coordination, uh, the coordinating arms, sorry, uh, before, just like in one step. So it's just like a bromination of an alcohol function over there. 
or uh, making this compound also. So the first ligand was obtaining 81% yield. It's a straightforward reaction and normal, I would say, nucleophilic substitution starting from TACN. And you can have like the compound, like I said, 81% yield and it's a gram scale applicable. So you can do once in, during your PhD, like uh, three gram scale synthesis, and then you can use it for three years and there is no problem. But the cool thing also is when you want to do some asymmetrical compound where you can see that there is one harm here that is different than the two other, then it's where the game starts. Cause like you literally, it's like, kind of a puzzle you need to like, because you only have three uh, secondary I mean here, but you want to like discriminate them. So you first start by protecting everything with like dimethyl acetal, dimethyl formamide. And then you can using a solvent that would precipitate only the first ammonium salt, you would only monofunctionalize over here on one nitrogen. Then using water, you can partially to protect this auto amide bridge to have like one amine, which is still protected. And then you have one pre uh, secondary amine where you can introduce a second arm, do another deprotection of this amide over there, and finally uh, install the new arm. And the compound was obtained in 61% uh, yield after seven steps and can be also obtained on a gram scale. So then when in our formula, when you have a ligand like this, first thing you're gonna do is do some coordination uh, chemistry. So we did some coordination chemistry with copper. And as you can see on the solid state structures, you can have like um, um, coordination, uh, coordination sphere of like one copper coordinated by the three uh, amine from the microcycle plus the three nitrogen from the cyazole arm. And you have a pseudo octahedric uh, conformation. We did the same with the with the other ligand. We couldn't get any uh, crystal structures, but DFT showed that it was like kind of the same uh, coordination sphere. And the most important here that I want to highlight is like oh sorry, that the carboxylic acid function does not bind to the co to the copper cation, so you can use it for further bioconjugation. We studied then the potential. Um, dissociation of our complex if you reduce them because like in the body as you can see here there is like very a lot a lot a lot of enzyme that can reduce like copper to complexes and has a potential of minus 0.4 to 0 0.4 um, according to ENH and so if you have a, co uh, a copper complex that has a, re a potential reduction in this region it, you want it to be super stable so what we did is just like normal cyclic voltammetry. So you can see when you reduce copper two and then you reoxidize copper one to copper two, we have a quasi reversible system. And we did the same on the copper one species by first oxidizing it and then reducing again. And we have like literally exactly the same thing. So we have a, we are able to have a copper one complex that is pretty stable. And we obtained uh, similar results uh, with uh, the, the other ligand over here after electrolysis and with this in mind we wanted to well this is to show you so it's like it's uh, it's fulfilled all the criteria to go further and so that's where i went to freiburg and did the new study now with like those three chelators and we did like i said we did functionalize some uh, bifunctional analogs so when you have like D functional stack and you can add the non-sharing function over here when you have a free amine but when you don't have any free amine you can put the um, entering function on one of the uh, bifunctional arms of a second generation one and then the third generation one would like require a C functionalization but it's like super difficult and we did not try it so for the first one we studied we used um this kind of NCS uh, entering function to like couple it to a name in and we used uh, the carboxylic acid for the second one. I cannot show you the result that we obtained on the third one because it's still not published, but I hope it's going to be published soon. So we just did some classic uh, on resin uh, peptide synthesis. So the synthesis was uh, was 
so we synthesize on the on the resin first, and then we couple it with uh, our chelator, either doing an NCS coupling or by activating using R2 activating the carboxylic acid, and we could obtain the protein uh, the the peptide sorry like in three and five percent yield after two days of HPLCs. And then some just labeling with natural copper gave the, the complexes. So we just like characterize them by normal HPLC. As you can see, the purity is like acceptable is more than 90% in the two cases. We then did some binding affinity to see, like I told you before, if like, cause it's literally the same peptide, just the chelator is changing. And as you can see, for this compound here, which is a plus two uh, copper complexes with a a geometry of like um, three nitrogen over there and just two over here. So a coordination number of five, we get an IC50 of 46.5, which is way more higher compared to the gold standard. But then when we use another copper complex, which this time is like uh, pseudo octahedral uh, complexes, we get an IC50, which is like almost an order magnitude less than the first one and better than the, the gold standard. So this result were like um, highly promising and we now want to go further and do some in vivo imaging with, with those compounds to see the biodistribution profile of each peptide. We just perform some classical radiochemic um, copper 60 for radio labeling and we were able to label the peptide in 15 minutes with a radiochemical conversion of 97 and 96%. And finally, we just did some small in vitro stability prior to go to in vivo. So just some uh, stability in competitive medium with like, we just incubated our complex, our radio complexes with just some uh, natural copper to see if there was an exchange. And we can see that there is literally no exchange after 24 hours. So they're quite stable. And we did the same with another uh, chelator by incubating it with DTPA with like, literally a lot a lot of dtpa and we can still see that there is like no uh copper dtpa forming after 24 hours so those uh radio complex are super stable and with this in end i just want to conclude on that we were able to synthesize first generation by functional analog of this prior uh, this uh, compound over there we showed that um, this one had um, the binding affinity of this compound wasn't good, but uh, the copper complex was super stable. And for the uh, second one, we had like the compound in high purity with acceptable yield. Uh, the labeling was super easy. The complex is inert against DTPA and natural copper. It has an high affinity better than the gold standard. So what do you want to do? like I said before, what we want to do now is do some biodistribution studies in pet imaging to see if like we can specifically target the cancer cells better than the gold standard. And with this in mind, I would like to thank all the people that were uh, here during that time when I was back in Brest and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, people were happy about the yield. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they're good yields. Um, except the the peptide ones. Is that yeah. I'm not familiar with it. Is that pretty standard to get like three percent yield? No, but like literally, um, when um, I spend only a month uh, in. Uh, so if I go back here, I spend just a month in Germany, and I spend like literally two days just to. I had one shot for each compound. It was just like <laughs> yeah. They did once and then you just do HPLC purification and you just want to have something super pure. So you're going to take only one tube of your pure fraction, prep it again, just to make sure that it's more pure, prep it again. And then you end up with like yeah, one milligram of compound and you're happy. Okay. Right. But yeah, so you, but you, like with, yeah, so with super three, high purity. Three, yeah. Four, yeah, with three or four months, you can then yeah make sure that you get better yield. But it's not that really even when you know that you have the compound in N, it's more than enough. And like a milligram of this can, they're still in the freezer in, in, the, in my lab in Brest and I can still use them if I want. So. Oh, that's great. The abbreviations are scary, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah they're quite, <laughs> well, when you're familiar with it, then it's like, uh, it's super easy, but I would, I should have said NO means uh, triazole cyclone nonan. So NO for nonan, which means that you have nine 
if you count here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine atoms in the ring. So this means that it's a Thiasian ring. And then uh, the two TH means that you have two thiazole units. And then you have one ethyl benzyl NCS. Yeah, well, then it's pretty, yeah, yeah, it's pretty really obvious when you think about it. But then at first, when you look at it, you're like, what? Yeah, well, when you are not a microcyclic chemist, well, the first time you're looking at this, you're like, oh, what is that? What the fuck <laughs> they are talking about? And then after yeah, three years in the field, you're like, oh, if somebody says something like, oh, yeah, it's like this. <laughs> Do you get to do you get to name it at all? I, I like I know there's a convention, but like if you if it becomes I never tried. more clinical trials, do you get to like come up with some uh, cool usually, name for it? Yeah, usually when it's clinical trials, you're gonna have like this peptide. Uh, so there is one compound was called like Dota RM2, and there is like this uh, peptide is also called in the clinic GMV594. But who knows right. what it means? But it's just maybe <laughs> the guy who did it was his five uh, five nine four reactions, and he did the peptide. That was the name. Uh, there's a and question about: is there a is that a particular peptide prevalent in non PCA cancer cells, and are these uh, delivery chemicals specialized for non PCA cells? This peptide is uh, well known for just PCA cell line. Uh, so it's not the only the only kind of peptide that you can use for prostate cancer. Like I said, the most common, uh, like the most well-known one, and which is just FDA approved now, is PSMA11. Okay, so here you can uh, you can see PSMA11, which is now used in the clinic, and this is just the binding motif that is going to bind. But it's another cell line, then it's LNK cell lines, but it's like the the gold standard now for uh, prostate. prostate cancer. But then when we go back to what we were doing here, yeah, um, this antagonist, uh, antagonist peptide is just like one of the gold standard for like PC3 cell line, which is one of the cell lines used in prostate cancer. But it's not the only one that you can use. I mean, people are also designing new uh, peptides and they just try it. And... How much can these techniques be adapted to other kinds of uh, cancers? This technique can be adapted to any cancer you want. You just need to find the right target. Because, for example, like uh, so, this bomb, so also this bomb basing analog can be used for prostate uh, for breast cancer. Because there's like some some of the some of the breast cancer overexpress also the gastrin releasing peptide receptors. But then, if you want to do like something else and work on another type of cancer, you just change the change the the targeting vector. Okay. So basically, you just need to think that like the peptide is a peptide, small molecule or antibody, they're just a taxi and they have like one address and, and the GPS is like the cancer cell. And okay. then you put whatever you want in it and you go there. And then you can do alpha therapy or just imaging and, or give some drugs. And... Uh, question about the spacer unit. You mentioned that that has a big impact. Is that just a mystery of biology it tends to things yeah. or yeah. yeah it's completely a mystery oh, okay. yeah, just because the, the, this this group who developed like the dota rm2 they put a normal ahx spacer at the beginning like a negative charge one and they showed that like when it was plus two charge it's like super like the affinity is way better than if it's negative or neutral so that's what we were like with our copper plus two complexes we had the same charge and we just used the normal spacer as well but it's some biology that yeah, I have no no clue why is it different. Like to be honest. Oh, there's a question about how stable does the complex need to be to be safe for use? Like, is it is it very hard to get things? I mean, it's obviously very hard to get things approved. But like, what's yeah. that? What's that process like as well? Well, this is when this is uh, like the selling point that we uh, we are when we are like designing new chelators. So in the clinic now, it's still the same that have been used for like 20, 30 years, and it's hard to like convince a biologist and be like, "Oh, you should use my chelator," like because it's like, "Oh, it's hard to make, but it's gonna be a little bit better." I think the the um, most important selling point is how your compound is gonna behave uh, in vivo. Is it going to literally make the difference? Because like we can show that it's making a difference in vitro and like they are super stable, so we can go further. But maybe in vivo they will they, they will be shit and then there's no point to use them. 
So I think yeah, the, the, the best selling point is just to get an image in a in a mouse and be like, okay, now I can prove that this tracer is better than what you're using. So you should change and and use this one now. And of course, these mm. will be degraded by the body to some extent. You will always lose a few yeah. percent to hydrolysis and different kinds of enzymes. And of course, you have to take into consideration, will it produce something terribly dangerous? Most of mm. the cases, no, it won't. We use... Well, so yeah. And I most mean... of the time, the compound are just excreted once they are like enzymatically cleaved. They are just excreted from the body, so it doesn't change your image too much. Also, we're we're here using the tracer principle, so that's actually pretty important to know. Like these radio tracer that we're using, we're using in so low so lo so low quanti uh, quantities that they will never have a biological effect. That's yeah. a fair point. Which is yeah. um, sort of true. There's there was I think one study where they did brain cat a uh, brain pet, and then suddenly they found a drug which was just um, active at picomolar or even lower it's just imaging somebody's brain and then they were super high yeah. <laughs> neuro can be weird but but typically that the the tracer principle holds true that they're we're losing we're using so such low concentrations that you don't affect the biology at all right so you're not worried about like the the metal toxicity it's all it's all the radiation oh, yeah no because like, it's too low concentration to uh, similar to we had the suspicions that astatine would behave as iodine would in the thyroid and sure i think they saw some accumulation in thyroid and the lungs and liver but nothing that would change much yeah. and there has no hasn't been any increase in Nice too early to say, but the the mice are fine. They haven't <laughs> developed <laughs> weird thyroid diseases. Yeah, nowadays there's some some groups that are developing also for pet imaging. Yeah, you can think that it's crazy, but like there are some pet tracers based on arsenic now. And when you think about it, you'd be like, oh, arsenic, uh. you know, that's a poison. But like, because the concentration you're using is too low, <laughs> that you basically you can't. Uh, can't do anything bad to someone with, with that. Rick, at half of your like acetine turns into polonium, right? Oh, yes. Like, but it's yeah. the really, really, really short half-lived one. It's like 0.5 right. seconds half-life. And it sends out some gammas, but they also barely give any dose. There's so few of them. We have such a tiny amount of atoms. And it basically doesn't have time to interact with them, whether it be biological toxicity, there isn't enough, and the radiation from the gammas, it's tiny, tiny. Thank you very much, everyone, for the presentation. Yeah, I thank think you. we can move on to general questions. All right, we'll go around. And what's one thing you really like about this field and one thing that you kind of get jealous that you, oh, well, not, yeah, jealous of other fields that you have to do it and they don't have to do it? maybe is is there problems with the like how fast you have to work and and mm -hmm. the reactivity or <laughs> you know the mice what do you what's what's the pro and con what's something you really like what's something you wish wasn't part of the the work um i mean something very cool that you hardly ever have in any other field in chemistry is that when you make a molecule you can actually get it from your lab bench into like straight into vivo and you can actually see, is it just like, if you inject it, it's just going to be pissed out within like five minutes or is it actually doing something? And almost every other field just stops at cells. And I mean, sure, everything can be poisonous to um, cancer cells. I think there was some study about brick dust and orange juice being, uh, being active against cancer. But um, you never really know un unless you actually uh, put it in a mouse or something so that's that's for me that's the coolest stuff about this and yeah maybe something you don't have to say something negative but <laughs> well i mean something that's a bit annoying is that we always have these zirconium two weeks and then we just do so much work <laughs> right. but also we get so many results so the the week yeah. after is great because you can write up your, all your stuff and well, it's just um uh, this week, last week, one girl in our lab had just all her stuff really working. It's just she's gonna have some great results to publish very soon. But she was so fucking tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I guess that I'm lucky that Astadine has a 7.2 hours half-life. It's not as bad as the pet chemical ones. So when we work, we have an entire day. That's nice. Uh, but then it's gone. What, we, what I miss... <laughs> yeah, what do I miss? Predictable chemistry. Understandable <laughs> chemistry. Understandable basic chemistry. It doesn't work with Astatine anymore. Being uh, able to run an NMR. Oh, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell. And even when I ran my NMRs, I didn't have enough of the radiolysis product. Yeah, or, or a crystal structure. Nope. <laughs> Astatine will fucking destroy itself before it will yield its structure. Like, we can only speculate that it will be a metallic solid, basically, because mm. as the further down you go in the halogens, you turn into mm. from the dense liquid into crystalline iodine, metallic shine, and then astatine. Yeah, because of the relativistic effect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And tennessine isn't worth talking about. No. Uh, it's just a few atoms. Mm-hmm. It's interesting computationally, tennessine. Uh, yeah. And... Um, but what I actually especially love with it is just being able to detect it so easily. I don't have to care about too much about other analytical chemistry. Sure, I love it, but uh, I prefer being able to just measure the radiation. Yeah, me, I would say like, well, the cool thing here is that I always talk with someone, you start with like literally a piece of paper, you draw a molecule, you go to the lab, we're able to make it quite easily. and. Um, then we can, like Simon said, like I'm going to say the same thing now that I'm in Simon, but it's to test it straight in vivo and get your result and see if it's good or not. And like some, we were lucky, some of our uh, photochemistry worked pretty well. So now we are working a step further on like doing this clinical translation, which is hard to do now because of the COVID and everything. But uh, hopefully we're going to get like a compound in humans soon which is like the best you can get, I think, from here. And yeah, well, the, if I have to say something bad about this, it's true, like well, when you have a zirconium week, it's like you do a lot of work. You like literally to get, like we have some graphs and papers. It's like, it looks just like a tiny curve, but like you need to do like 40 tubes and by end with a pipette to put 200 microliters in it, cap them, count them, do this in triplicate, do this, I don't, I don't know how many times, count this for like the whole week. And I think yeah, the most painful was one time we were doing this on a Friday. It was like almost uh, 11 p.m. and we ran out of like cabs. So we had to go with the Geiger counter to see all uh, tubes and take the cabs out that were not radioactive to cap our tube again. So yeah. <laughs> But again, that's brilliant. You could just detect the radiation on the cap. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. No, that was there, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's the, the thing you don't want to do on a Friday at 11 p.m. No, you just no, want to go. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it makes me feel, feel good as well. Like, you guys are all, like, there's an end goal you're all working towards. Like, you guys are all mm-hmm. helping to beat cancer, I guess, in a way. Yeah. Right? Like, you, yeah, that's a good, that end good goal. feel. That's super cool with this kind of chemistry. It's like there is literally an application straight away it's not like making a molecule for the sake of it or just like trying to understand which i mean it's we need this kind of chemistry also i know that it's just not for me and here also like simon does it but simon does a lot of dft to understand what we are like producing and everything so we are doing the full range of kind of chemistry possible yeah from quantum to the miles everything mm-hmm. It's pretty that's, awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you have all kinds of fields combined, which is great. Yeah, yeah nuclear chemistry is a transdisciplinary. Do you find that is something really like a, an advantage, or is it is it a bit a bit frustrating how like broad it is? Well, because I'm really, like you had a pathway. You said you did you did PhD basically just in organic chemistry, and now you'd have to learn how to deal with mice and all that. Is yeah. that- <laughs> That well, that's, what, well? that's what I yeah that's what I wanted to do because uh, my PhD like I I got some skills in organic synthesis and microcyclic chemistry be able to literally design the chelator you want and but I was missing this part because like the further I went to just like do some radio labeling and to be honest when you do it it's just mix like doing radio labeling is super easy. You just take your radioactive metal, you add your chelator, you like mix it for five minutes, do a TLC, that's done. 
And then I did a little bit of cell work also. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I want to go further. I want to like literally develop a tracer and go like until the in vivo imaging. And that's what I can do now. But it was difficult at the beginning because like you don't know anything about biology or again, <laughs> organic chemistry. You know, split cells, you never did it. So you just learn and at the end, it's fine. You have to be very good at adapting. Like earlier yeah. this year, um, I built a computer for my professor with like 64 cores and then the program wouldn't run. So I had to learn how to compile it. <laughs> then um, I started building this automated box. So I had to learn how to program for Arduinos, how like which motor there exists, how to control all of that. Um, and then uh, I did my PA, uh, I did my master's thesis in organic synthesis so just total synthesis of some natural product and um i'm now pretty computers. diversity <laughs> I, it was great these nine months to learn how to do all types of synthesis but um at some point i got kind of sick of just doing the same reaction again and again <laughs> yeah it sounds like organic chemistry really hurt you guys like you <laughs> you <laughs> well, it wanted was, to stop doing it <laughs> it was great to learn because now um if uh, now I think I can probably make most molecules that I set out to do, like I, I've learned the basics about just properly synthesizing stuff, but just synthesizing for the sake of synthesizing isn't really enough for me. There was a question earlier about like um, the pathway to uh, a lab like this. So do you have people that do sort of all sort of fields or is it mainly chemistry or do people have a physics and biology background as well? Well, here everybody does everything. I took a master's course in the end of my bachelor's with uh, Professor Holland. And I at some point I was just like, well, I still have to do a bachelor's thesis. I might as well ask that guy. And then came in for six weeks of, of proper stuff, did one zirconium week, and we actually got a paper out of this six weeks. So that was pretty awesome. You can start with whichever, like with, with whatever skills you want and then just be, have to adapt and learn more mm. yes have you ever had any radiation incidents a question from chat you probably don't want to talk about it if you have yeah as well anyway so feel uh, free to not talk about it i, I have also. my first one me uh, well we can't talk it was a funny thing back in 2014 <laughs> when i was in earl it was gallium 68 so it's fine i mean when you're radioactive usually you just have to wait or you like if it's on your skin, you wa you're going to wash your skin with soap and everything and normally it should go out. If it's on like part of your trousers or stuff, then you just need to wait. And what happened to me is that one of my shoes was radioactive. And like the half-life of gallium is 68 minutes, but takes time, like, like it takes a day to be non-radioactive again. And like the pet center was empty the building, so it was another building close to the chemistry department. So my supervisor was there, just gave me some glove box as shoes and I had to wear those to go back to the chemistry building. It was pretty <laughs> funny, yes, because everyone was looking at me with my glove box on my on my feet to go back to the chemistry. And then I was like, fuck, oh, I'm gonna go home without any shoes now. So I didn't <laughs> have an extra pair. Yeah. So I had to wait and once they were no radioactive, I could go back home. I don't God, think I good. spilled any astatine. Uh, never, of course. Never. Very, no, I've. It's an amazingly annoying to pipette like microliters of chloroform. It just it ejects itself out of the syringe. So sure, I've spilled some drops maybe, and it has evaporated. But I never like tipped the entire vial because that would be silly. But luckily, it is. It's self cleaning. It disappears in a day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The Vismut is, of course, slightly long-lived, 38 years or something. That's 50% of it turns into. But you just take all the paper, place it in a bag, and leave it for waste management. I um, did uh, drop plutonium on my glove once, but... Oh, haven't we all? Haven't no, we? I have not. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is something we have not done. <laughs> the classic mistake of forgetting that you're holding a... Uh, micro pipette in your hand and you're in a glove box and it's really annoying to maneuver and then just accidentally just tip nudge the tip to, on the big gloves oh well there's nothing dangerous it's just annoying to contaminate stuff because then you know you have added to the contaminants in the glove box is that is that a five liter volumetric flask behind you 
Yeah. <laughs> Decent. Look at it. Oh, it's fucking brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> Healthy addiction. Oh, yeah. I said so, right? <laughs> and it's, I got it for 20 euros as well. Oh, yeah. I cost. Look at that. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Can feel plenty of wine into that one. Something new <laughs> yeah. every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do you see the field in 10 years? It's because the question we ask at the end here is because someone might be watching this YouTube video in a couple of years time, and then they might enter the field in a couple of years after that. So someone watching this video could well be doing research in 10 years time. So what do you think they will be doing? Will it be drastically different? Do you think it's more of the same? What do you, and make some wild predictions, come on. Just. In my case of targeted alpha therapy, I'm really happy where we're going at the moment and believe that in the next 20, 10 or 20 years, there will be widespread usage. But of course, maybe it's shown that it's not viable or something better always ends up taking its place. But at the moment, having Astatine with its reasonable half-life, the single alpha emissions, <clears throat> is the simple chemistry when you do the halogenations. It's basically a halogen when it wants to. <laughs> so you use like n succinamide to attach it to phenyl groups. That's simple chemistry. And it works well. It works brilliantly. So hopefully it, we will get through phase two and three and get uh, production in small cyclotrons as well in hospitals, which will lead to widespread usage. And I mean, yeah, in the field of bed tracer development, I think uh, it's an endless field. Like in 10 years, it's going to be like more and more people working on this. And maybe we'll have new tracers with like new isotopes that we don't know yet. Maybe that could be a cool thing with new properties. And hopefully most of like what's doing has been doing now for like the past 10 years and it's gonna still be, uh, be investigating is to find something that goes literally to the clinics and change, changes the game. Um, let's fight this cancer. Let's see one if one day we can get rid of cancer. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree that, um, I mean, especially with imaging, I hope we get better at um, finding the right treatments against cancer. Um, yeah, that's probably where we're, where we're headed. Uh, mm -hmm. People always talk about finding cancer earlier, but radioactivity is not really the, um, the way to find cancer earlier because you can't just inject activity into some healthy human without suspecting they already have cancer so, yeah, so <laughs> that's sort of a point that everybody always says that's not really true um but yeah as soon as we know somebody has cancer we can hopefully figure out what exactly the cancer is and how we could treat it with some uh, some good imaging and so I mean, PET, PET, PET imaging is um here to stay in terms of like i mean obviously yeah. but it, it's going to be the best still in in the foreseeable future Definitely. Yeah, yeah, it, it's way better yeah. than expect. So um, it's got some pretty big advantages about over. So spect is uh, imaging with um, gamma instead of um, beta particles, and that's just it, there's some problem with backgrounds and uh, it's just less precise and you can't quantify yeah. it as easily. And um, I mean, we're we're gonna start make uh, using more. Um, combined so a pet ct is pretty standard by now but i guess at some point we'll start using pet mri uh, machines which are currently not really a thing that's in every hospital i think mm. the first ones are starting to get bought but it's just sort it's of non-existent there's an interesting thing you said there. you said other isotopes and it made me think if and when we find the next island of stability there might be be reasonable usage of isotopes because at the moment we can't just use the two nanosecond the helium isotopes or whatever but mm -hmm. if there is an island of stability maybe there is something that is two well i don't know eight hours yeah. ten days or something yeah. Yeah, two, mm -hmm. even less or 20 minutes or 100 minutes like florin is it yeah would be awesome to see of course we don't know about the chemistry we don't know yeah get it for it yet could be really could be really cool i mean there's um carbon 11 is used heavily in brain pet and yeah. um that has a half-life of 21 minutes um 20, I think. 21 minutes. 
and uh, you can do like there's people doing proper total synthesis on this like putting this single carbon oh, yeah. in the middle of a, of a huge molecule and then injecting <laughs> it and then in, can, within 20 minutes yeah yeah you can you yeah. can actually um, stretch this up to maybe an hour of synthesis maximum but then that's really it's really preclinical that's very very much not clinical views and then pretty crazy yeah. That's right. There's good predictions. That's uh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. I mean, personally, I hope that my box that I'm building right now uh, is going to revolutionize everything, and that everybody uses antibodies. And uh, hopefully, we don't all only use um, zirconium. I mean, we could make an aralazide with with acetine. We could make an aralazide with uh, actinium and all of that stuff, and also use that for therapy then. There is one therapy, uh, cancer treatment therapy, that uh, I don't know too much about, but I know it's uh, increasing in popularity. It's the boron neutron capture therapy. Yeah, that's pretty really cool. Yeah, you <laughs> inject the boron compound, if I recall correctly, into the interesting area, or you can chelate it and send it in with vectors mm. probably. And then you bombard it with the neutrons, which activates yeah. the bor borons. It captures the neutron. It then splits into lithium and helium and some gamma rays. So you basically get a very concentrated dose from basically the helium, the high mm -hmm. linear LET radiation that packs a punch. Also why it's difficult now for alpha therapy, because if you just use an antibody with alpha therapy, you're going to have like some... Some of your compounds is going to also go to non-desired region like the liver, the kidneys, and everything. And that's the problem now with yeah radioactive radioimmunotherapies to be able to target only the cancer cells, which is like one of the most challenging things. Because if you want to do some therapy, you don't want to destroy the kidneys of the patient or his liver, if possible. <laughs> we have two different kinds of therapy. We have palliative and we have curative. A lot of cases will be basically to increase the last few years of the patients more than it is to cure them. Of course, we want to cure them, but there are some lost cases, sadly. Of course, by early detection and proper, um, proper radiopharmaceuticals, maybe we can reduce the palliative treatments and increase the curative ones. Thanks for sticking around, everyone. <laughs> um, people have any follow-up questions or anything like that, they feel free to contact you on Twitter. I, yeah, you know, sure. And, um, yeah. Ask some yeah. stuff and cite your papers as always. Important. Yeah. Well, Good job spot. Thank you for everything. It was yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming on and thank you for having yeah. us. For your talks. <laughs> yeah, it was all very interesting. So um, thanks, chat, as always. Turning and, up to Twitch, it's always nice. And we probably won't have an episode in January because I have exams to study for. <laughs> ah, <laughs> more exams? Didn't you do them? Couple of months ago, is it proper <laughs> chemistry this time or chemical engineering? <laughs> mm, is it chemical engineering or proper chemistry? Proper no, we can't chemistry. Say that. Oh, Thank no. God. No. <laughs>